just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Dr. Hind. Um, I work at the uh, KSU, uh, responsible for the training program. Um, I uh, used to work at the King Khaled Eye Hospital, so it's my second home. And um, this lecture may be not scheduled to start with, uh, but uh, let me just remove my, uh, it's better for me. Uh, but uh, what happened is that we had an apology and for the sake of teaching and training, I hate to uh, really cancel uh, any lecture and uh, your, the time for the residence is very precious. So we want to utilize it for, uh, for teaching. I already communicated with my Dr. Hattan. He's the one who is going to give you the orbital tumors uh, from the clinical uh, investigations um, and management uh, aspects. And I thought it's a good idea to give you this introductory um, lecture on orbital tumors as well. Same topic, but from the uh, clinical pathological aspects uh, so that you will, um, you will be able to link what we are talking about today to the uh, information that he will give you uh, later. Uh, the, so the objective, as I mentioned, is to be familiar with the most important orbital pathology in terms of classifications and especially the, the neoplasm uh, and uh, appreciate the clinical pathological correlation that I just mentioned and the uh, frequency of the orbital neoplasm, especially if we are seeing an adult with uh, an orbital lesion or suspected tumor versus uh, in children. And I think this is important. So as I said, the prevalence for the neoplasm will be different. Uh, depending on the geographical area, ethnicity, race, and sometimes depending on the way the study was conducted, you know, the design of the study, the methodology, and so on. So when I used to do literature search for um, any specific orbital tumor, for example, uh, sometimes I face difficulties because some of the studies on orbital uh, lesions will include all lesions, inflammatory, uh, structural, and so on. So sometimes the percentage and the frequency or the distribution of the tumors, actual tumors, is a little bit different. Uh, some of them, they include lacrimal gland the tumors, some of them they don't. So um, sometimes in the literature review, it's a little bit um, uh, troublesome for somebody who's gonna write an article uh, or a study or do a study on, on this topic. But generally, they are generally rare. Uh, the previously reported prevalence of orbital neoplasm is 3.5 to 4, approximately. The, again, the other thing that's a little bit controversial is the way to classify them. Some people like to classify them based on the origin, yani histopathological origin of the lesion, which uh, uh, tissue exactly is it coming from or arising from, or according to the site, or the clinical behavior. Uh, but there is... Um, uh, a classification that I do personally like, and I find it, um, you know, like easy to grasp and to understand. Uh, why is this easier? Because any anatomic structure that you can think of in the orbit, whether it's a nerve, um, muscle, soft tissue, anything can be a source for a neoplasm. So if we are looking at, the, at these orbital lesions in terms of primary lesion, meaning that it's originally arising from that tissue in a primary way, that's the primary site for it, versus secondary, where the tumor origin originates from a nearby tissue, versus metastatic. And metastatic here means that the tumor or the lesion reached the orbit either by hematogenous spread or lymphatic spread. So I want you here for the sake of the residents specifically to differentiate between the word secondary and the metastatic. Secondary will mean that the tumor is coming from a nearby tissue, they, for example, a sinus or from the brain. Uh, uh, the best example of, uh, about this is the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, for example, uh, and then it reached the uh, orbit. Could be also secondary from, um, uh, from uh, you know, like a periocular uh, area, like uh, eyelid from the skin or from the conjunctiva coming to the uh, orbit, extending to the orbit. So primary, secondary, metastatic, I feel that this is a nice, uh, you know, classification. Uh, looking at the orbital topography is important. Again, this is not um, our main uh, issue or topic uh, here. 
uh, but just remember that you have the bones surrounding the orbit. Uh, remember that you have many structures, the globe, the lacrimal gland, the muscles, the tendon, the fat, fascia, vessels, nerves, sympathetic ganglia, cartilaginous trochlea, all these can be a source of neoplasm. And this is just um, an illustration to show you the, um, the, uh, the many structures that you can uh, see in the orbit. And I'm sure that you can study this uh, in terms of anatomy uh, and so on. So primary orbital lesions among the classification that I favor are the commonest, and they range from 56% to 77.29%. Second, the tumors are less, uh, maybe around 20. They range from 18 to 36 percent. Metastatic will be the least common. They account only for 0.32, so even then less than one, up to 10 percent approximately. Uh, unfortunately, most of the orbital lesions are malignant in some of the reports, with a prevalence as high as 86 uh, percent. But as I told you before, this will depend on the study design itself and the way they, they put it and where the study is done. For example, if you do a study on orbital lesions in KKH, for, ex for example, which is a tertiary eye hospital with a um, uh, good number of referrals, most probably you will find more malignant because the, the cases that, the type of cases that are gonna be referred are not gonna be the simple cases. They are gonna be the more difficult uh, or the malignant tumor uh, cases. In terms of the demography, as I told you before, uh, uh, the, there is a difference in the distribution of the orbital lesions among the adults versus the children. But all in all, in general, the orbital lesions are more common in adults. Majority of patients will present in sixth and seventh decade. And the median age for orbital tumors, at least in the USA, is 55 years. And I will come across um, two, two major studies that were done uh, as thesis for uh, previous uh, residents, uh, one on orbital lesions in adults and the other one on children. But I favor to put this at the end of the talk uh, because I want to give you the principles first. Uh, frequency of the orbital neoplasm will differ, as I mentioned, depending on the age. But the usual presenting symptoms uh, in common, in, in regardless of the age or in both uh, age groups, will be proptosis, uh, extraocular motility disturbance, diplopia, lip dysfunction, sometimes pain, um, uh, and uh, sometimes rarely maybe it might affect the vision, especially if it's causing pressure on the globe uh, and so on. Neoplasm will include the rachmic gland lesions, will include lymphomas, and I'm not gonna talk about lymphomas because it's a whole different uh, spectrum. Uh, meningiomas, neurofibromas, schwannomas, rhabdomyosarcomas, and vascular tumors, in addition to meds. These are the most important ones that I want the residents at least to um, have an idea uh, about. For the lacrimal gland lesions, the epithelial lacrimal gland tumors account for 10 to 16% of the uh, orbital lesions. Um, the two main epithelial lacrimal gland tumors uh, that I keep telling the residents that they have to see the when they do the rotation to check the slides, be familiar with, with these and know how do they look like. Uh, they are mostly the pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, in other terms, we call it a benign mixed tumor. And from the malignant group uh, affecting the lacrimal gland, the adenoid cystic carcinoma. Um, I want to stop here, um, not stop sharing, but at least uh, try to, sorry for that. Uh, one of the participants, I want one of the R ones to tell me why do we call the pleomorphic adenoma as such? Otherwise, I will just pick. Um, maybe the ones who are doing um, the uh, the uh, the pathology this year about contribution. The pathology is a little bit, you know, like yani uh, kida uh, yani dry. So I want contribution while we are saying the lecture. Walid, Walid Hayat, you were doing pathology, sah? But if you even jump in, anybody who wants to answer uh, while I'm talking, it's fine. Interrupt me, uh, contribute. I'm going to interactive. In the beginning, we were talking about things in general. But now I want some contribution from the residents. Why do we call the pleomorphic adenoma? Pleomorphic adenoma. Yes, Why this? Yes, 
go ahead. I'm not, I'm not sure if it is related to the morphology of the, of the yes. tumor and the, uh, yeah. the nothing's wrong. Yeah, it is related to the morphology. We call it benign mixed tumor because it has two components. Anybody else who can name these two components? Uh, uh, we, yes, yeah. so we have yeah. fibrous component and epithelia. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, this fibrous component, I would uh, elect to call it stromal component. Why? Because sometimes it's more fibrous. Uh, most of the time, it's more mixometous. Any mixoid um, background. Uh, sometimes it can even car be cartilaginous. So it's a stromal component at the end. And the epithelial component is more like glandular, similar to these uh, structures uh, or, or the architecture of the uh, lacrimal gland itself. Uh, okay. Um, so um, just a second. Just doesn't want to advance anymore. Okay, so it's the commonest benign epithelial lacrimal gland tumor, the premorphic adenoma, and uh, uh, it, it's variable again in the prevalence from one area to the other. It was accounting for 20% um, of epithelial lesions, for example, in one study that we did here, uh, while in South Asia, the prevalence of it is much higher, 75%. Uh, and it's higher than in Caucasian population. Age range will be very variable. Keep in mind that even though the premorphic adenoma happens in the adults, there are reported cases of, um, of uh, premorphic adenoma in children, even the adenoid cystic carcinoma. So the age range here is very wide, uh, wide from 13 to 81 uh, years. Now, what's the problem with the premorphic adenoma? When we were residents, they used to teach us, the oculoplastic team, and no, um, the never do a biopsy for pleomorphic adenoma if you are suspecting it. Um, so what is the current teaching now? I want somebody from maybe from the senior people or fellows in uh, oculoplastic or even oculoplastic attendings. And why is the biopsy used to be forbidden? Anybody? Well, Harja, I need to assign somebody to, to, to speak up. Any of the residents, senior ones? And I'm sure Dr. Abdullah Khan with us, yes? Yeah. Okay, anyhow, we'll continue for the sake of the time. Um, so we used, when we were residents, they used to tell us don't do biopsies at all. Why is that? Because there is a risk of malignancy um, um, the, if in the, in the, if, if, if it happens that you do a biopsy and the tumor stays uh, as a long standing uh, tumor. So, uh, they are usually afraid about the, uh, incisional biopsy if it is done preoperative, uh, of the risk of this, um, uh, recurrence and the associated malignant transformation. However, currently they, uh, oculoplastic surgeons, um, they defend themselves that even if they do uh, biopsy, if the uh, surgical tract is removed along with the whole bulk of the tumor with the capsule around it, uh, you can get away with it and nothing would happen. But anyhow, I think that clinically and radiologically, you can um, make a good um, uh, judgment uh, because of the, uh, the bone remodeling that happens uh, rather than the bone invasion, for example, in premorphic adenoma, uh, uh, in, in uh, making uh, the, the history from the patient, for example, because it's slowly growing, because it's a benign uh, tumor to start with, benign lesion. So if you make the proper diagnosis uh, initially, uh, I still uh, think that it's favorable, uh, all in all, among the oculoplastic surgeons, 
to go ahead and uh, do the uh, excision, the excisional biopsy, meaning removal of the whole tumor with the uh, pseudo capsule that surrounds it to make sure that uh, you will not have a recurrence and you will uh, also uh, uh, save the patient the risk for any malignant uh, transformation. Okay, now the pathologist in this case, his duty, and it's the duty of the surgeon to get me the whole specimen um, in one piece with the pseudo capsule. For me as a pathologist, I have to uh, grossly examine the, the specimen, make sure uh, when I do the serial sections to embed the, uh, the, the whole tumor and to make sure that the pseudo capsule is there. Uh, uh, you can dye the, uh, the surgical margin of excision with, with ink. Uh, in order to ensure the complete excision of the tumor. Uh, histopathologically, usually, as I said, it's a well demarcated and surrounded by this pseudo capsule. And as we mentioned before, it has um, a proliferating epithelial component and a mesenchymal or stromal component, and that's why we call it a mixed tumor. The epithelial component will be more or less similar to the glandular structures, ductile structures, and sometimes non-ductal spindle uh, round cells. Um, in the recurrent cases, you might have some squamous metaplasia of these duct, uh, epithelial components, and they might look squamoid rather than uh, ductile. So this is just an example uh, here uh, of, of, uh, of the pseudo capsule here where my arrow is, is, is uh, is and then uh, if you can appreciate the epithelial components the darker ones that have some ductal uh, appearance here with some secretions these secretions will be stained with the alcium blue and then you have here the stromal component that we are talking about um, this is again uh, another photo uh, to show you the mesenchymal component the stromal component here and the epithelial component here here it's more solid like but here for example you have more glandular like structures that mimic the uh, lacrimal gland uh, tissue with the secretions uh, in the middle. Uh, that's why if you uh, do a, a PAS stain, periodic acid shift stain, you will be able to see these secretions in the epithelial component of the uh, tumor. Um, uh, while the stromal component, as I mentioned earlier when uh, Dr. Al-Sulaiman uh, uh, answered me, uh, it could be myxoid, hyaline, cartilaginous, or even sometimes uh, osseous. Uh, but uh, more commonly the myxoid. This is what we tend to see uh, more. And this is an example of a myxoid a stromal background. Okay, uh, You can do also alcium blue staining and it will stain uh, nicely. Uh, so that's the stromal component here where my arrow is. And these are the epithelial components. It could be cartilaginous. And this is an example of, cart of the cartilaginous one. That's the stromal component again in the middle. And these are the epithelial component here at the uh, edge. Uh, and this looks like immature cartilage. Of course, it's not going to be like the mature cartilage appearance, but it is cartilaginous in, uh, uh, in consistency. Um, uh, again, we mentioned before that the in total surgical excision is very important because of the risk of the recurrence and the malignant uh, transformation. And this is the point that I mentioned earlier about the controversy about the, the incisional uh, biopsy, that you can still remove the biopsy tract and get away you know, with it. Uh, the malignant transformation can happen in any of the uh, components, meaning that it can happen in the stromal component, and in this case, it will give you a sarcoma or sarcoma tumor. Or it can happen, of course, in the epithelial component, and in this case, can give you either adenocarcinoma, that's the more uh, common one that we tend to see, or mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Uh, adenocarcinoma, keep in mind, though, that it can happen de novo, meaning that it can happen without a prior history of pleomorphic adenoma. So the adenocarcinoma, as we mentioned, and this is just an example of, uh, uh, of, of the malignant change. And uh, maybe it's subtle change to you as residents, uh, but if you look carefully at the slide with uh, uh, higher, higher power and so on, you will see that these cells and, um, are not uh, benign looking. And even the configuration here is different than the uh, benign uh, configuration of the epithelial component that we tend to see 
in uh, in uh, benign uh, mixed tumor. Um, the uh, the carcinomas uh, are usually poorly differentiated, and I mentioned here specifically the infiltrative growth pattern in red because it's very important for the pathologist again when he checks the recurrence uh, to check whether the adenocarcinoma or the malignant component is infiltrating the pseudo capsule uh, around it and. Um, Keep in mind that when we see the recurrence, uh, usually it's not really well demarcated like the initial excision. So the best uh, deal for the patient is to have the good excision from the start by a good experienced oculoplastic uh, surgeon. And more, I mean, like all the cases that we have seen before, uh, at least in KKH, uh, where the bulk of my cases um, uh, was there before, when I was there, uh, the, the removals or the excisions were all um, really complete. Um, uh, you see here, for example, uh, if you compare the, the, this picture with the arrow where you can see the, the tumor reaching up to the uh, surgical margin of excision, there's no really true pseudo capsule in the recurrence uh, in the same way that we have seen it in the uh, original picture of the pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, terminology has been controversial. If it happens, if the malignant degeneration happens in a recurrence, some people like to call it carcinoma X, pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, and some people, if, um, if the malignant change happens in a tumor that was not touched before, not surgically removed, but arises as a focus, they call it carcinoma in pleomorphic adenoma. Uh, but anyhow, uh, the good histopathological examination is really uh, essential. Uh, regardless of the of the terminology that you are using, and as I mentioned, if the tumor is reaching, the, can um, can uh, can everybody make sure that they are muted, please? Thank you. Thank you. The participants or the uh, just make sure you are muted, please. Uh, okay, back to our topic here regarding the um, the terminology. Regardless of it. Uh, you have to uh, identify the, the malignant change and identify whether it's infiltrative and reaching the margins or not, because this will affect the prognosis. Uh, this patient started off with a pleomorphic adenoma that was removed elsewhere outside KKH at that time. Uh, and then he had one initial uh, recurrence. I don't know if you can appreciate a difference between the cells here. I know that uh, you know, like not, if you don't look at the slides uh, themselves, maybe it's difficult for you. But if you can appreciate here that some of the cells here are atypical. However, at that time, uh, there was only one focus of atypical cells that was uh, mentioned, but we didn't really consider the whole tumor as being uh, malignant. But then uh, there was um, uh, a third recurrence and the third recurrence was uh, really um, a straightforward uh, malignant uh, mixed tumor. Now we move to the adenocystic carcinoma. It's the commonest malignant epithelial tumor of the lacrimal gland. Uh, again, the age range it still can happen in children. So you can see that it uh, ranges from 12 years to 75 uh, years. Now pain in the adenocystic carcinoma, I keep stressing this on the page on, on the, for, for the residents. Uh, it's usually a cardinal symptom because of the perineural uh, invasion. The survival, of course, um, uh, is uh, relatively um, uh, poor. 10-year uh, overall survival and 10-year disease-specific survival is 38.7 and 51.4% uh, respectively. And where, what, where is the death coming from? It's because of the distant metastasis, mainly lung, brain, bone, in addition to the intracranial uh, spread. Now, um, again, adenocystic carcinoma is typically non-encapsulated and it's infiltrative. That's why even for the clinicians, the oculoplastic surgeons, they can easily tell from the uh, uh, history uh, being more acute, from the pain, from the bone erosions when they do the radiology imaging uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the clinical examination, they will uh, easily um, suspect it. Uh, from my aspect, from the pathology point of view, you. I always tell the residents also to remember in relation to adenocystic carcinoma, the word Swiss cheese, because that's the descriptive term for the uh, tumor, because it has a cryptiform uh, appearance. But still remember that it can be um, solid, it can be tubular, it can uh, have mixture of uh, different patterns, and it can be even basaloid in 
uh, appearance. For the crepe reform on the Swiss cheese appearance, that's classic. This can come in exams in OSPI or in a quiz because you can easily spot it and you will uh, not forget it. Again, another uh, uh, picture of the adenoid cystic, but the solid, uh, which can be basaloid looking, maybe a little bit similar to the basal cell carcinoma even, uh, that's more difficult to uh, appreciate. Uh, so it won't come, you know, like uh, uh, like in, in exams. And you can have mixture of both, a more uh, solid uh, basaloid uh, appearing uh, tumor like here, and more uh, tubular like this one here. Uh, we do some stains uh, for the tubular areas or for the cripriform areas, uh, especially the PS, the musicarmen, uh, and so on. Uh, and um, uh, one of the um, areas for MCQ questions also for the sake of the residents are the progno prognosis uh, indicators for the adenocystic carcinoma. Remember that the solid type or the basaloid type is worse. Um, uh, the, if there is perineural, of course, or bone invasion, that's going to be also worse. Tumor size, of course, if it is large, it's going to be uh, bad. And the tumor staging, according to the AGCC staging, uh, if it is, you know, advanced staging, then again, it's bad. Uh, now we move to the soft tissue orbital tumors. Uh, it's one of the most difficult areas, even for the histopathologists, because the soft tissue lesions um, are, are not easy to uh, diagnose. Uh, uh, of course, the radiology will help uh, a lot. And I do remember also when I was at the KKH, uh, Dr. Sahar was really doing a good job when it comes to the diagnosis of these uh, tumors. Uh, out of these, I think the most important one to talk about uh, is the rhabdomycercoma. It's highly malignant. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, we did, as I mentioned earlier, um, a study in Saudi Arabia about the pediatric orbital lesions. And even though the non-structured tumors may be more commonly the dermoid cyst, for example, will compromise a lot of the, uh, of the regions, 37% uh, of the total. But uh, if we are separating the neoplasm, out of the neoplastic, truly neoplastic uh, lesions, uh, excluding the, the structural ones, the rhabdomyosarcoma is the commonest. Pathogenesis is not uh, clear, but it is related to pluripotent mesenchymal cells that might resemble uh, uh, muscles, and this is important for us um, uh, in terms of the diagnosis as pathologists because we tend to do immunohistochemical stains to prove it um, uh, using the muscle uh, lineage uh, immunohistochemical stains. Uh, for the sake of the residents, just remember the most important uh, histological types, uh, the, and uh, remember that uh, we have the more common is the uh, uh, embryonal, which have better prognosis. Uh, and remember that the alveolar is the uh, one that has the worst prognosis. But luckily enough, our most of the our cases are uh, embryonal type. It's the most uh, common. The, um, uh, the, this is an example of rhabdomyosarcoma. I always keep uh, telling the residents when we uh, review the slides in our pathology sessions, uh, don't bother about the appearance because rhabdomyosarcoma is one of the blue cell tumors that includes other uh, tumors as well, uh, might be difficult for them to appreciate or to diagnose. So it would not come as an OSPI or a, or a quiz unless it is associated with clinical photo or radiological uh, image to help you in the diagnosis, which happened in one of the, uh, the final board exam, in one of the exams but it was not like purely only histopathology uh, image. The cells like to grow around blood vessels, as you can see here in the picture, this is a blood vessel here. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you have a very good, um, uh, well-differentiated tumor, you might end up uh, seeing some Z bands similar to the bands that we see in the muscles. This is the alveolar subtype, which is um, uh, less uh, differentiated. And we do whole sometimes panel of the immunohistochemical stains. You don't really need to remember all, all of the names, but at least be familiar that you are doing muscle markers. Uh, for example, the myogenin, it's the one that's more commonly uh, expressed, but we sometimes use Desmin, uh, smooth muscle actin, and uh, uh, myoD1 as well uh, in other cases. Again, another important thing for you to read in theory uh, for the residents uh, is the genetic aspects uh, of the rhabdomyosarcoma, um, especially if you are uh, uh, comparing the familial and the sporadic cases of the embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. 
uh, commonest clinical presentation would be unilateral apoptosis, which is fast, fastly progressing over a few weeks. Uh, and the survival will depend on the disease extent uh, and so on, but I don't want to go into the uh, details of this. Uh, the uh, embryonal, as we mentioned, have better survival rate than the alveolar. Uh, we'll move now to the neurogenic um, uh, soft tissue uh, tumors in the orbit. They will include neurofibroma and schwannoma in addition to the tumors of the optic nerve, uh, meningioma, and glioma. Uh, the neurofibroma, it could be either sporadic or associated with neurofibromatosis one. And when we look at these uh, cases um, in terms of pathology, we have the diffuse type and the plexiform type, most commonly. In addition to the uh, localized or the isolated neurofibroma, where it happens only along one nerve. Uh, I'm not going to go also into further uh, details, but uh, this is just an example of a, of a neurofibroma. Uh, in a patient, uh, grossly and histopathologically. Histopathologically, you will find all the elements of neural tissue, including axons of, uh, of uh, nerves, uh, and uh, sometimes also even Schwannian uh, cells. Now, the difference between the diffuse and the plexiform is that the uh, plexiform neurofibroma will be similar neural uh, tissue proliferation, but uh, surrounded by perineuria. And as long as surrounded by perineurium, it will um, uh, be histopathologically looking like this, where you have isolated uh, islands of the neural tissue surrounded by the perineurium. And this is very important for the clinical pathological correlation because this will uh, be like prominent or thickened nerves. And this is what gives um, the, the feeling of bag of worms when you try to palpate or to put your hand along the uh, lesion uh, in, in patients who have this uh, plexiform neurofibroma. Uh, this is uh, an example of a case of solitary neurofibroma uh, where you have also the axons uh, within a myxomatous background. The, these are all neural uh, tissue, uh, but it's going to be isolated or localized in along one nerve with no uh, features at all of neurofibromatosis. So you have to make sure that the patient doesn't really have the stigmata of any neurofibromatosis. We had uh, one case uh, in, um, that was um, uh, uh, seen um, uh, and examined, uh, removed before, uh, and we had several cases afterwards. Even when I came here to King Abdelaziz Hospital, uh, there were uh, isolated, you know, like uh, rare cases. Uh, we'll move now to the schwannoma. Uh, schwannoma uh, is usually slowly progressing. That's why it will cause uh, proptosis, but over several uh, years. Um, the, uh, they are rare in the orbit uh, in general. Uh, they have also well-defined uh, margins, and they also arise in relation to orbital sensory uh, nerves, mostly the supraorbital and the supratrochlear. Now, uh, for the hist pathology, we have two usual types of cellular growth, uh, the Antony A cells that are closely packed, spindle-shaped, uh, and Antony B, uh, where they have distinct cytoplasmic, cytoplasmic margins. The Antony A is the common one. And also, um, I always tell the residents, in relation to each tumor, there are specific terminologies or facts that you have to remember. For example, for the schwannoma, you have to remember the Antony A cells and the Verruca bodies because Verruca bodies are very characteristic. Um, it's it's only just a pattern that happens between the spindle cells that are um, uh, uh, proliferating. Uh, so these are the uh, Antony A cells, and the Verruca bodies will be actually the uh, area, the pinkish area between uh, the two group of of cells that are. Uh, spindly and they are wavy, uh, um, uh, like maybe here in this picture, they are more uh, clear. So uh, I will just use the arrow. So the vertical bodies will be these uh, pinkish strand like uh, uh, areas between the cells. Like, for example, you have a group of cells here and here, and th these are the vertical bodies. So you can easily spot them. Um, and, and see them. Just keep in mind also that the schwannoma, because it's, it's slowly progressing and slowly growing, it can be ancient and become cystic. Uh, this might, you know, like create a problem for the diagnosis, especially the radiology uh, part of it uh, in the diagnosis, but uh, we still can appreciate it histopathologically. 
Now we move to the meningiomas. Again, the meningiomas are one of the uh, tumors that might be linked to neurofibromatosis, but it's going to be type 2 um, uh, in children. Uh, and uh, they either arise from the intracranial cavity and then extend to the orbit, or they can arise from the optic nerve sheath itself, as you can see here. Uh, it can be arising from, uh, from intracranial and then spread here or originally from the uh, sheath around the optic nerve, uh, whether it's uh, anterior or posterior here towards the uh, canal. Yeah, so different sites. Now, another thing that you have to remember always whenever we talk about the meningioma of the optic nerve, especially if you are going to compare it to the, uh, opti the other important region of the optic nerve, which is the optic nerve glioma. The, because the meningioma is arising from the sheath, uh, if you notice here radiologically, you will find that the thickening or the uh, enhancement will be along the uh, actual nerve here in the middle. And this is what we describe as tram tracking. So it will give you tram track appearance versus the appearance of the uh, optic nerve glioma because it's arising within the nerve substance itself. So it's going to give you like a fusiform uh, enlargement or thickening of the nerve. Now for the meningioma, it's mainly proliferation of the meningothelial cells themselves, but they tend to wor form whirly appearance or configuration, in round configuration. That's why some of these cells, if they are small whirly uh, structures, uh, the cells, if they become degenerated, they give you um, uh, a typical uh, round structures that we call somomopathies. So if this comes in the exam, most probably they will bring you a case that has lots of these samoma bodies, and these samoma bodies can even be uh, calcified. Uh, and if the meningioma is full of these, sometimes we call it samomatous uh, meningioma, uh, and it is um, uh, a good sign. So if you look with me here, uh, I will try to use the arrow again. These are the whirly configuration of the meningothelial cell proliferation in meningiomas. And if you notice, we have here one small round pinkish structure, another one here, another third one here, and up here we have also this, and this, and this. So this case actually has uh, uh, samoma bodies. All these round structures uh, are samoma bodies, uh, which will help you in the uh, diagnosis. Now we'll move to the optic nerve glioma. Uh, optic nerve glioma, um, uh, they are mostly isolated, but still keep in mind that uh, they can be still associated with neurofibromatosis uh, type one. Uh, the, uh, the structure of the glioma itself or the cellular correlation is usually low grade when it is in the optic nerve compared to the gliomas that happen in the CNS. Uh, so they are pilocytic astrocytomas. They are very similar to the structure of the nerve itself, but the nerve will be uh, thickened. Um, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, they can be associated with neurofibromatosis uh, type uh, 1. This is just an example of um, uh, anterior um, orbital presentation of proptosis in addition to disc swelling because of uh, a glioma. Uh, it can give you posterior orbital canalicular presentation where you have mostly decreased vision and maybe no uh, proptosis, but in this case, there will be relative afropicularity defect, or it can be even uh, asymptomatic. Uh, uh, in this case, as we mentioned, you really have to check the patient very well uh, for any signs of uh, neurofibromatosis or cathayole spots. Uh, and of course, with the radiology, uh, you will find here, if you remember, we mentioned that the, the region will be uh, enlargement of the optic nerve itself rather than the tram tract appearance. Here, this case is even more prominent. You can see here that it's really a huge uh, enlargement, and that's the corresponding gross uh, photo of it, the, uh, the cross section of the uh, tumor. And as I mentioned, it's very similar to the original structure of the optic nerve itself, but it will look uh, much uh, uh, thickened. Um, so it's mainly proliferating pilocytic uh, astrocytes. Uh, this is just uh, another example, and that's the histopathology appearance. You still have the pile septi that you usually see in the optic nerve uh, structure, but of course this proliferation is uh, abnormal. Another thing that you might need to remember in relation with this, if you are lucky enough, sometimes you see uh, what we call resental fibers, uh, but not in all uh, the cases, in addition to isinophilic grandeur 
uh, body in association with the uh, uh, with the glioma. Uh, so um, uh, we'll move now to the vascular lesions. Uh, vascular lesions, I think the commonest one that uh, the oculoplastic surgeons tend to see uh, is the lymphangiomas, where you have uh, endothelial lined uh, vascular spaces. Um, uh, these are the endothelial lined vascular spaces that are filled with uh, lymph. But the importance of, uh, of, of, uh, of the lymphangioma is two aspects that are related uh, to the clinical um, behavior uh, for our clinical pathological correlation. Number one is that patients sometimes with the uh, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, they have more uh, uh, symptoms or, uh, or more uh, proptosis uh, because we tend to have lots of uh, um, lymphocytic infiltrate near the lymphangioma, sometimes even in the form of lymphoid follicles. Um, so uh, this might explain why do they have this uh, thing. And the other thing is keep in mind that within the lymphangioma space, you can have a bleeding or hemorrhage and formation of chocolate cyst. And in this case, also the patient might come with uh, increasing uh, proptosis or more uh, symptoms. The other uh, vascular lesions are the cavernous hemangioma that you can see here. Again, it's endothelial line vascular spaces, but they are filled with blood. Usually it's um, surrounded also by like a, a capsule, a fibrous capsule. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, oculoplastic surgeons are really very good in diagnosing these and in and their excisional biopsy. The other one that happens more common in the uh, children versus the cavernous, which happens more in adults, is the capillary hemangioma. And again, I'm not going to go into details in regards to the diagnosis and the um, uh, clinical and uh, you know manifestations and the management. Uh, but this is a higher power of the uh, cavernous uh, hemangioma, uh, where you can see here the endothelial lined uh, spaces here that are filled with blood. And it's, a, it's not a fast, um, it's a, like a, uh, 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 the, the speed of the flow, it's, it's, a, it's a slow flow uh, lesion. Uh, that's why sometimes in some of the uh, spaces here, you tend to see kind of a separation between the RBCs and the plasma-like fluid here. Uh, very similar to what you see in a blood tube if you leave it uh, outside and we call this a hematocrete uh, effect. Uh, now we move to the metastatic tumor to the, to the orbit. The frequency is very variable depending on the on the uh, age. Um, the uh, in adults, for example, uh, it, again the difference will be uh, based on the gender. Uh, breast cancer, for example, would be the commonest in women. Uh, and keep in mind also this is another um, uh, thing that sometimes they do like to. Uh, to question it, uh, especially in oral exams. Uh, be aware that because breast cancer is the most common metastatic lesion in the orbit in women, uh, it might sometimes, because of the type of the original breast cancer, the scarous one, uh, pre present as an inophthalmus rather than uh, proptosis or exophthalmus, uh, or, or can cause retraction of the globe and sometimes even restriction of the extraocular movements, depending on the type of the uh, um, of the breast cancer, the original one, the primary uh, lesion. So this was an example of the uh, one of the cases that I have seen at the KKH. Um, uh, here there are some uh, muscle, and that was taken from the uh, orbit. Uh, and I don't know if you can appreciate these uh, strands of the abnormal malignant cells, uh, which uh, we call Indian uh, files. Uh, again, um, as you know, whenever there is a metastatic lesion, uh, it's usually less differentiated than the primary one because it's growing in a different environment, growing in another place that's not its original place. So uh, the uh, orbital myths uh, are difficult to diagnose sometimes because of this reason, and sometimes you have to do immunohistochemical uh, staining, uh, especially for the hormone uh, receptors uh, and so on. Um, uh, but again, you don't really need to dig into the details of this. In men, the commonest primary will be from the uh, lungs. Uh, other less common sites might include the neuroendocrine, the colorectal, and even cutaneous uh, melanoma. Uh, the, also, uh, you can consider uh, osteosarcomas, but if they are uh, rare. Um, the... Uh, 
uh, this is just the study that we tried to, to do uh, the, before as a thesis for one of the residents at KKH. Um, that was mainly in, ch in, in children age 18 years or, or younger, and we reviewed the uh, histopathology and the radiology imaging. So as you can see here, if you are looking at the total number of the biopsy lesions, we didn't do it from the clinical aspect, we did it from the database of the pathology uh, lab itself, the uh, pathology department. So we took all the um, biopsies, and as you can see here, the cystic uh, and the vasculogenic uh, uh, were uh, considered non-neoplastic, but the cystic was the commonest, followed by the vasculogenic. Uh, and, uh, but then when we looked at the truly neoplastic ones, the, the last categories here, uh, as you can see, the commonest out of these is the rhabdomyosarcoma. And this is, again, the um, distribution only of the uh, neoplastic lesions, the 40 out of the 107 uh, biopsies that we have seen. So as you can see, again, the rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is the commonest, followed by the uh, peripheral nerve uh, tumors and then the lymphoid uh, tumors. Uh, we noticed something else also in that study uh, is that there was um, uh, some geographical uh, variation uh, that is related also to the delay um, in the presentation and the, the management of the cases, uh, most probably because of the uh, referral system. Um, so well, what we concluded at that time is that the benign, mainly the structural lesions or the cysts, commonly the dermoid, in addition to the vascular commonness, of course, would be the capillary in that age group. They constitute about 60% um, of all uh, these uh, lesions. Uh, and the new plastic only 37%. And out of this, as I said, the rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma uh, was the third involving the orbit in general, but the commonest among the truly uh, neoplastic uh, lesions, which is similar to what has been reported before. But this is, for example, there are two things here uh, that are important. Keep in mind the first point that we mentioned at the start of the, of the, of the talk, that the geographical variation is very important. Uh, for example, our lymphocytic leukemic lesions were way less than uh, what's mentioned in Africa. Yeah, we're accounting for only 0.05%, luckily. Uh, the second thing is that there was a similar study done by the previous group of oculoplastic um, surgeons, uh, I think at the time maybe of uh, Dr. Weatherhead uh, at KKH uh, and Dr. Johnson. Um, at that time, believe it or not, the most common orbital lesion in that age group was the secondary retinoblastoma, uh, but that was like more than 25 years ago. Um, and uh, this is not, you know, unusual just in our area, even in, in other areas of the world. Uh, and this is fading away. Now we tend to see much, much less secondary retroblastoma in the, in the orbit uh, because of the advanced techniques in the diagnosis and in the management of the retroblastoma over uh, the years. Um, in general, uh, even though I don't want to dig deep into the clinical, the proptosis uh, is uh, uh, and or eyelid preocular swelling uh, were the most common presenting complaints in that age uh, group, uh, less than reduced vision or, or diplopia. Now, if we compare this to the adults, we also did a retrospective study, similar study uh, for the orbital lesions uh, in, in adults, but we in this one, we excluded the lacrimal gland lesions because that was studied before at KKH. And uh, this study was again a thesis for um, one of the uh, of the uh, of the residents who's now uh, attending maybe um, or uh, at KKH. Uh, it was Dr. Abrar uh, Salama. Uh, anyhow, uh, we uh, we we did this uh, um, in collaboration between King Khaled uh, Eye Hospital and King Abdelaziz. Uh, the, uh, in, in this one, the most common were lymphoproliferative to start with, followed by vascular, and then secondary tumors. Um, um, so we had, you know, in that uh, group, uh, more lymphoproliferative in comparison to the uh, pediatric. Uh, this is just to show you the category with the, um, uh, as you can see, the lymphoproliferative uh, constituted about 26%. So it's the highest, followed by the vascular in 21.8%, but this gives you the distribution of all uh, different subtypes of the lymphoproliferative and the vascular. And as you can see here, for example, because they are adults, we didn't have here any uh, capillary hemangioma, for example. They are mostly cavernous, of course, 
in addition to some AV malformations, lymphangioma, and so on. Uh, the secondary uh, were mostly arising from eyelid or conjunctiva. Uh, and uh, out of the neurogenic, we had schwannomas, solitary neurofibroma, and uh, meningiomas. We uh, here in this um, uh, uh, classification, we included all the uh, lesions, orbital lesions in general. So it will include also the structural and the uh, and uh, and other ones. Um, the uh, so here uh, we looked at the uh, the demographics, uh, meaning the the gender distribution. And if you uh, can notice here, for example, for the lymphoproliferative, uh, it was more common in males, uh, while the vascular lesions were more common in uh, in females. Um, again, the clinical symptoms, there has been overlapping uh, clinical symptoms, but when we categorize the, the symptoms according to the type of the lesion, lymphoproliferative versus vascular versus secondary and neurogenic, as you would expect, the uh, proptosis was very prominent uh, as a symptom in addition to ptosis and lit edema, for example, for the lymphoproliferative, while if you go to vascular, you have you tend to have less ptosis and lit edema, but you still have um, the proptosis as a major uh, complaint. When it comes to secondary, because the type of the tumor is, uh, is different, you tend to have more pain and tenderness because it's an infiltrative uh, tumor within the uh, orbit, and you tend to have uh, uh, sometimes mass lesion and so on. So the clinical, um, uh, you know, like uh, symptoms were a little bit variable from one group to the uh, other. Uh, this was the uh, outcome. Uh, so as you can see here, almost 80% uh, had uh, no recurrence and satisfactory uh, outcome. Uh, in addition to some cases where we had residual tumor or there was further extension and invasion. Um, the, uh, this is just the gender distribution, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and the comment uh, among the, uh, about the cavernous hemangioma being the commonest among the vascular uh, lesions, um, and uh, the outcome that I just uh, mentioned earlier. Um, thank you all for listening, and if you have any questions, um, I will be glad to answer. Okay, uh, if you don't have any questions, uh, I hope you, know, yani you can maybe review this lecture before the subspecialty lecture for Dr. Hattan. I know it's still, uh, can, Dr. Hattan's lecture is still far away, further away, uh, but uh, uh, I know that the KKH, they do record the, uh, the, uh, the talks, uh, and it will be nice if you can, you know, like go through it uh, briefly. It will complement, I'm sure, his uh, lecture that he will talk about in terms of diagnosis and clinical uh, manifestations and, and management. Okay. Regarding the secondary tumors, do you mean those that arise by direct extension or hematogenous sympathy? Okay. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, Walid, secondary. Okay, tumors are the ones that are extending from a nearby structure. This can be either from an eyelid lesion, uh, they can be from a conjunctival lesion, they can be from a nearby sinus, from nasal cavity, and so on. Adol, and I favor to call them secondary, and, and they, are, they should be different than the metastatic. Secondary meaning, you know, it's an invasion or an extension to the orbit, going to the orbit. Okay, I think, I hope that this is clear to you. METS means really metastatic lesion, coming from far away, primary, that is not uh, uh, nearby the orbit at all. So it comes uh, via hematogenous or lymphatic. I know that in some of the literature, by the way, they will still call them secondary, because in terms of the understanding, they are still secondary. Yani mahum primary in the orbit. Uh, you know what I mean? So عشان كده يمكن you find them in some of the literature by some researchers إنه بيجمعوهم مع بعض ويعتبروهم secondary. Okay. Type. I don't see any more uh, questions. Okay, thank you all for uh, attending. I hope it's not uh, boring to you. Uh...
if you need any assistance in terms of pathology, Dr. Azza Maktabi is doing a great job in the Confi KKH. Uh, we do consult each other a lot uh, and we share cases, interesting cases. And, um, you know, like I will be more than happy to help you out in any uh, project that's related to uh, pathology, histopathology, ophthalmic pathology. Uh, or if any, for any cases uh, as, a, as a consultation as well. Well, best of luck to all of you. Thank you.